Good day everyone, you may have never heard of multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a disorder in which the brain and spinal cord are affected, thus causing communication problems between our brain and the rest of the body. This happens because the immune system will attack the protective sheath of your nerve fibers, leaving lesions or scars and eventually causing permanent damage to the nerves. Many people might not be familiar with the term myelin sheath. Actually, it is an insulating layer or sheath that forms around the nerves, including those in the brain and spinal cord. For your information, the estimated number of people with multiple sclerosis worldwide has increased to 2.8 million in 2020. It is estimated that someone in the world is diagnosed with multiple sclerosis every 5 minutes. Multiple sclerosis happens when the immune system mistakenly attacks the nerve cells and destroys them which leads to all sorts of sensory, motor and cognitive problems. In multiple sclerosis, immune cells will go to the brain. When immune cells reach the brain, they are activated which induces the dilatation of the blood vessels that leads to inflammation and causes damage to the nerve. The damaged nerve cells will form multiple plugs in the brain and spinal cord, thus slowing the messages that travel along the damaged nerve. However, the brain can repair the damaged cells. Over time, this process becomes less effective and the damage becomes permanent. The causes of multiple sclerosis are still unknown, but it is believed to be linked to both genetic and environmental factors. For genetic factors, it might include the female gender, as well as having the gene that encodes a specific type of immune molecules, which is used to identify and bind to foreign molecules. For environmental factors, it might include infections, as well as vitamin D deficiency. There are some risk factors contributing to multiple sclerosis. Some of them are age, sex, family history, and vitamin D deficiency. Furthermore, smokers, people with diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, and people suffering from migraine or certain infections including Epstein-Barr are more likely to get multiple sclerosis as well. To make it easy to understand, we should be alert when we are experiencing the symptoms of multiple sclerosis such as fatigue, vision problems like color blindness and loss of vision, numbness and tingling, muscle spasms, stiffness and weakness, mobility problems, pain problems with thinking, learning and planning, depression and anxiety, sexual problems, bladder problems, bowel problems or speech and swallowing difficulties. But the symptoms are unpredictable. Some people's symptoms develop and worsen steadily over time, while for others, they can come and go. So kindly have a medical checkup if somebody is experiencing any signs and symptoms mentioned earlier instead of freaking out yourself by giving your own diagnosis. It is important to get yourself a medical checkup as there are a few tests that need to be run through to confirm a multiple sclerosis diagnosis blood tests, lumbar puncture, MRI scan and evoke potential tests are examples of the tests that will normally be scheduled by the doctor. Some of you might wonder why so many tests need to be carried out, but they do have reasons behind it. For instance, blood tests are able to rule out other diseases with symptoms similar to multiple sclerosis. Then, a lumbar puncture, which is a procedure to remove a small sample of cerebrospinal fluid from the spinal cord by inserting a needle into the lower back, is then tested for the abnormalities in the immune cells and antibodies associated with multiple sclerosis, indicating that your immune system has been fighting disease in your brain and spinal cord. After that, scanning MRI can show whether there's any damage or scarring of the myelin sheath in your brain and spinal cord. Finding this can help to confirm a diagnosis in most people with multiple sclerosis. Lastly, 
The evoke potential test is the most common type of evoke potential test that assesses how well the eyes work. Light patterns are shown to the eyes while your brain waves are monitored using small sticky patches called electrodes placed on your head. It's a painless test that can show whether it takes your brain longer than normal to receive messages. The goal of therapy in patients with multiple sclerosis is to shorten the duration of acute exacerbations, decrease the frequency of multiple sclerosis, and relieve the symptoms that are suffering by the patient. According to the neurologist, the multiple sclerosis patients may be grouped into four major categories. The first category is relapsing remitting sclerosis, RMS. This is the most common type and affects about 85% of multiple sclerosis patients. RMS can later be converted to secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, SSPM. The third form of multiple sclerosis is primary progressive multiple sclerosis, PPMS, which only affects 10% of the patients. Last but not least, the last type of multiple sclerosis is progressive relapsing multiple sclerosis, PRMS. This is the rarest type and affects fewer than 5% of the multiple sclerosis patients. For the patient with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, the first line therapies are immunosuppressants like interferon beta, IV corticosteroids, and others. Interferon beta is involved in decreasing damage to the nerve cells, while corticosteroids are involved in the suppression of the protein leading to the inhibition of inflammation. Then, the second line therapies are natalizumab and alemtuzumab. Furthermore, there are two important oral drugs that can be used in the treatment of relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis RMS, and active secondary progressive multiple sclerosis SPMS. The two immunosuppressant drugs are siponimod and quadribine. Siponimod blocks the release of lymphocytes from lymph nodes, so fewer lymphocytes in the brain and spinal cord, while quadribine can inhibit DNA synthesis and repair of lymphocytes. As a result, it will decrease the number of lymphocytes in the brain and spinal cord, less inflammation and reduce the progression of multiple sclerosis. Last but not least, ocrelizumab is a special immunosuppressant drug as it is the only current drug that can treat adult patients with the relapsing forms of multiple sclerosis and primary progressive multiple sclerosis PPMS. This drug can attack immune cells that are involved in the disruption of the nerve cells and hence protect the body. So now, we will talk about the non-pharmacological treatment of multiple sclerosis. Actually, there is supportive care that can be taken to control the undesirable symptoms or reduce the progression of multiple sclerosis. In terms of lifestyle modification, regular exercise like stationary biking, treadmill, swimming, stretching, balance exercises with or without physical therapy is recommended. Because exercise conditions the heart and muscles, reduces plasticity, prevents contractions and falls, and has psychological benefits. Then, patients should maintain as normal and active a life as possible, but should avoid overwork, fatigue, and exposure to excess heat. Cigarette smoking should be stopped since multiple sclerosis patients inevitably have weakened immune systems and lung functions. Furthermore, a low fat, plant-based, seafood diet and vitamin D supplements are recommended as well. The study concluded that, over time, the patients with proper lifestyles were able to sustain healthy lifestyle choices that led to a decrease in their overall disability. Other than lifestyle modifications, they do have therapies that can be implemented to manage spasticity in multiple sclerosis patients. Physiotherapy, electromagnetic therapy, and transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation are examples of it. For information, hyperbaric oxygen therapy can be used in slowing the disease progression, even though this area is not quite as common and more evidence is needed to support the benefit of this therapy in the treatment of multiple sclerosis. Last but not least, consult a health professional if you have any symptoms. Please remember that referring to the healthcare professional is definitely a wiser move than freaking out yourself from your diagnosis. Thanks for your kind attention. That's all for today.